Um, welcome to uh, LSE and welcome to the politics of squares. I'm Catherine Fieschi and I'm delighted uh, to welcome you here tonight um, for what is a, a really rather, um, I think, quite extraordinary and moving occasion. Um, this 10 years of the Global Civil Society yearbook. I'm really delighted that we're all here to mark this. Um, and to mark this at the end uh, of quite a series of extraordinary events for the past uh, year, year and a half. I think this is a, this is a, a particularly uh, relevant uh, edition. It's a particularly relevant time to assess the meaning uh, of the uh, concept of global civil society. Um, so that's what we're here to do tonight. And, and I'm doing this with, um, with some fantastic speakers. Of course, I've got Mary Caldor uh, and Helmut Anheyer here who have been editing this book uh, and who are going to start off and, and tell us uh, a little bit about what it means to have been doing this for, for 10 years. And then I've got two eminently qualified people to talk about the politics of squares. When I first saw the title, I thought, is this some sort of insult about the geeks who care about uh, global civil society? Who are you calling square, I thought. And then I realized that we were talking about Syntagma, we were talking about Tahrir, and of course, uh, we were talking about the various places where the Occupy movement uh, is taking place. And, and for this, uh, we have tonight uh, Ahmed Naguib and Laurie Penny, both of whom are wonderfully qualified to talk about this. Just before we, just before we start, uh, I'm afraid a rather illustrative, but also, um, I suppose, more uh, tragic note. Um, it's been, I was handed this, um, this article uh, about um, Egyptian protesters killed in Cairo today. Um, and I think it sums up pretty much how we feel about the last year and why it's so relevant to talk about this uh, tonight, uh, moments of extraordinary exhilaration and, and joy and liberation, um, followed also by, by moments of disappointment uh, and tragedy and, and violence, but also cynicism, resentment, uh, as, um, as elections on the European continent uh, are, are showing right now. So how do we talk about global civil society in a period that is so full of exhilaration, but also full of uh, of tragedy and full of cynicism as well um, in the context of, of established democracies. So I, I'm going to stop and I'm going to hand over immediately to, uh, to Mary who's going to start us off. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Catherine. And it's really great that we've got Ahmed and Laurie to come and talk about the squares. So I'm going to be very brief and really say something about, not about squares, but about the Global Civil Society project and give most of the time to them. Um, this project began when I came to the LSE in 1999 to actually set up this research program. And at that time, everyone was talking about globalization. And globalization seemed like this rather impersonal, structural, deterministic process. And what I thought we ought to do was to think about what I called globalization from below, and in particular to recognize that globalization is something made by human beings, <laughs> and there's agency in globalization. And so I used the term global civil society as a frame, really, for thinking about globalization from below, to thinking about the role of individuals and groups uh, in crossing borders and trying to change society. I came across the term, and I think this is interesting for this generation, I, I came across the term civil society for the first time in the 1980s in Eastern Europe. I think it's interesting because nobody talked about civil society in those days. A few Marxists did, mainly Italian Marxists, talked about civil society, but otherwise it was just not a term in common discourse. And I was a peace activist and I came to Eastern Europe and they were talking about civil society as being self-organized, about autonomy, 
about not about capturing power, but about changing the relationship between state and society. And I thought, this is a whole new language that expresses what I'm trying to do. So I was very excited about it. And what was interesting was that it was very much linked to the global, even though people didn't talk about it as global. I mean, we at that time talked about the European dimension because activists felt blocked at a national level. They really felt they couldn't succeed. So you had to go around the nation state. And you went around it both above and below. You went around it through the spread of international law. So in the case of the Europeans, it was the Helsinki Agreement that was so important in giving them an instrument with which to campaign against their governments. But you also went around it through links with groups abroad who helped to create more political space. And I think it was that emerging political space that gave way uh, to the revolutions in 1989. And actually, long after this, I went back and looked at what was happening in Latin America at the same time. And actually, civil society re-emerged by Cardozo in the, in the um, 70s in Brazil quite independently because it was something about dealing with militarized nation states. So it was, so civil society was emerging as a global phenomenon. The interesting thing about 1989, I think, and that has a strong parallel with what's happening today, is that policymakers and scholars all declared themselves as astonished. It's generally said, why did no one predict 1989? Actually, all of us who'd been engaged with the opposition in Eastern Europe knew something was going to happen. We didn't know what, we didn't know when, we didn't know what form, but we knew change was on the way. And actually, E.P. Thompson, the historian who was a kind of pioneer of bottom-up history, predicted the end of the Cold War as early as 1982. So it simply isn't true that it wasn't predicted. The problem with scholars and policymakers was that they were always looking in the wrong place. They focused on states and policy elites. And this, to me, also meant, in social science terms, something was missing. And this is why we needed a different pro project. Um, just one more word about what was happening at this time. I think you can also say that 1989 was, if you like, the culmination of the post-1968 social movements. And actually what happened after 1989 was the consolidation or institutionalization of those movements. I think the same thing happened to labor movements in 1945, but labor movements turned themselves into national institutions they turned themselves into trades unions and labor parties, whereas the post-68 social movements during the 90s turned themselves into international NGOs. And they, became, they were more international and more local because they felt blocked at a national level. And Helmut and his team did a fantastic job in tracking the growth of these NGOs. He'll probably say something about it. Um, so, the aim of our global civil society project was actually both political and, and, and scientific. In, in social science terms, we really wanted to develop a new kind of knowledge. A knowledge that was both more bottom-up than most social science knowledge and escaped from what we came to call methodological nationalism, the, conf the fact that everything in social science is defined by the borders of the nation state. But it was also a political project because by turning global civil society into a social science concept, you also, as it were, legitimize it. You create a kind of platform for voices who've been excluded from official discourses. So it was both a political and a social science project. Now, we were due to launch the first yearbook in New York on September the 17th, 2001. 
And in the days leading up to the launch, there was huge media interest. We were telephoned by the New York Times and the Newsweek, and we were really excited. And then came 9-11. And 9-11 meant not only that we cancelled our launch event, <laughs> but actually it meant that in a way the whole project veered off course. Um, actually... 9-11 seemed to be a return to sovereignty and no one sort of in the mainstream was interested in global civil society. But actually the interesting thing is that if the 1990s were a period of consolidation and institutionalization, the 2000s have been a period of remobilization. And that's what we've actually tracked in our yearbooks. And interestingly enough, when it I mean, this is something that we've, is a finding from research we've done this year, which we aren't going to talk about now, but you can ask us about, on um, what we call subterranean politics in Europe, the squares and protests. Actually, the mobilization in the early 2000s has been just as big as it was in 2011 the social forums, the mobilization against the Iraq war. <laughs> but what's been different in 2011 is that it somehow struck a chord in the mainstream. I mean, you take an example like Occupy in St. Paul's, and actually many of the people who were in that occupation had been in climate change action, had been outside Parliament Square. But it was the occupation in St. Paul's that generated this incredible debate within the Church of England that could hardly be a more established institution. So it's been a period of mobilization, but it only really became visible in 2011 with the Arab Spring, with, the with Occupy. And I suppose our question is, is, our new, is global civil society now becoming relevant again? <laughs> Mary Helmut, over to you as uh, you. the longtime co-editor <laughs> and founder. Thank you. Thank you so very much. It's, um, it's always a pleasure and an honor being, being back here. Uh, Mary and I came uh, to the school at about, this, about the same time, and we hadn't worked together before. We knew of each other, and we soon... Uh, joined forces, and um, my main task was to look into data. Of course, I could spend hours talking to you about data problems. I won't bore you with it. Um, but it, it seemed important to do it for uh, a number of reasons. Uh, you, you could say, if you were to simplify matters, unless you can show that something really exists and what it looks like, uh, some people deny it, 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 its existence or have very, very different perceptions and ideas about it. And that applied to global civil society. You know, what, uh, try to talk to somebody who hasn't really become an expert on it, what it actually is. What does it look like? What are the contours? In a way, can you draw a portrait of global civil society? And that was the challenge that, uh, that we had at the very beginning. And uh, we went beyond that. We said, not only do we want to tell people, uh, here are the dimensions, the structures, the, here's the composition of global civil society. We wanted to map its dynamics, its development uh, over time. And we, we did that with, um, uh, I think, some ingenuity, if, if, if I may say so, but also with um, a certain perseverance of, over the years just to keep this uh, data project going. Because unlike economic statistics and unlike uh, information about uh, demographics and, and so on, uh, these statistics are not readily collected by anybody and they're not maintained. Uh, so uh, it was qu quite a bit of work over the years uh, to, to do this. We uh, nonetheless decided that it's probably best to track civil society along, or global civil society along four dimensions. And one is we call infrastructure. Uh, what, is the, what are the organizational vehicles, if you wish, that globalized efforts, globalized activities beyond the market and the state take? Right? And of course, NGOs would be one example. So we were interested in how many NGOs exist, for what purpose, where, and how long. Right? And we soon discovered that the, 
the infrastructure of global civil society goes well beyond NGOs, and I'll say more about this in a moment. So the infrastructure, we want to map the infrastructure, but then it, uh, what does the infrastructure stand for? Well, what are the objectives? What are the values? What are the attitudes? What are the norms that, that global civil society presents, enacts, stands for? Right? So there was a value element to it. Uh, think about uh, how tolerant are we as a people? How respectful are we of each other? Uh, what are the levels of civility in the world? Right? These were the kind of questions that we had when it came to the second component, um, called it values and attitudes. And then, of course, if global civil society exists, it must, it must do something. Right? It must act, so their activities. Uh, what do they do? Well, advocacy is one element. Uh, <coughs> delivering services is, is another one. Collecting information. Right? Being in uh, the business of communication. Debating, right? So the activities of global civil society, and all of that was seen in a context, and the context is what Mary already alluded to, uh, economic globalization. We, in the 90s, were certainly very, very much impressed by um, economic globalization, which turned out to be largely globalization of financial markets. Not, not only, but uh, to, to a significant degree. Now, what is the relationship between civil society as a globalization force and economic globalization. Right? And as the other context that was of great interest to us was how does the globalization of the rule of law, the internationalization or the thickening of international law relate to globalization of civil society. Right? So that's what we, we did over the years. And we came to uh, quite a number of interesting findings that I uh, won't uh, summarize at all, but I just want to point out uh, two or three differences that we observed over the decades. Uh, we found out that uh, the, the 1980s, and all of what I'm going to say now in conclusion of my brief uh, comment uh, here, is on page 23 of this uh, really excellent book, uh, page 23, uh, that in the 1980s we had the acceleration of growth in a particular organizational form that we saw in global society, civil society, and these were the NGOs, right? And in, in many ways, the 1980s was the first decade that was dominated by NGOs, and these new NGOs that were created in the 80s were linked to the new social movements at that time. And you can think of uh, perhaps Greenpeace as the quintessential NGO that came out of a movement dating back, as Mary said, to the late 60s, came of age in the 70s, but then found its full bloom, and it's still blooming very much under the leadership of Kumi Naidoo, but in the 1980s, Greenpeace was there. In the, in the 90s, we saw a quite dramatic shift in what NGOs stood for, and we call them the corporatization of NGOs. Right? This is the, the, the emergence of public-private partnerships of many, many kinds, and NGOs become part of a gigantic new public partner private partnership and service delivery system in uh, largely in a north-south dialogue. Now, to come to 2000s, that was totally challenged. And, and Mary pointed out that September 11, 2011 changed many things. Right? And it, it brought into question, I think, the kind of model that was at the root of what happened in the 80s and 90s, the expansion of the NGO movement. And in the 2000s, we saw the emergence then of new forms, new forms of globalization in civil society, the World Social Forum, right? the, uh, the way in which uh, people got together, not on a permanent basis, but to debate, to deliberate. And that was very much a kind of the forum, many kinds, was it, a phenomenon that we saw in the first decade of the century. And we think that what we label subterranean politics and a new social justice frame that is put forward by uh, activists right, is characteristic of the decade in which we, we live now. That's why we have such a keen interest in observing what is happening to the Occupy movements and the like. So over the 10 years, we saw many, many changes and I think what we saw is the resurgence, the, the coming back of the activist as opposed to the NGO uh, operator that, that uh, seemed to be the prototypical uh, person in, the, in global civil society 10, 15 years ago. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, both of you, um, uh, and I'm hoping that um, later on with the questions we can, we can return to, uh, to some of the points you've made about the, the changes in terms of how we understand the concept of, of global civil society and what it tells us about our understanding of globalization, which obviously has been um, evolving. But now I turn to my next two speakers, um, and first to Ahmed Naguib, um, who has a very direct experience of, of one of the squares uh, that was most in the news, uh, Tahrir Square. So over to you, Thank Ahmed. You. Thank you. Sorry. It's very cozy up here. <laughs> I'll try to squeeze my four-page intense presentation in ten minutes. You can... <laughs> no, no, but well, yes, but I, I, can, I can say, you can take your time. <laughs> well, let me start by telling you um, about my entrance in the UK just uh, yes, uh, last night. Uh, when I came in, the immigration officer looked at my invitation letter from LSE and asked me, politics and squares? I said, it has nothing to do with geometry. Uh, let me tell you that. Um, <coughs> It's an interesting topic, but let me tell you where I come from. I come from a, a, a generation that was more or less brought up under the Mubarak regime. But I, I come from a family of uh, political dissidents uh, for over 40 years. My parents um, left Egypt in the 60s, and they met uh, both of them here in London. Uh, they both worked for BBC. Arabic transmission, and they were political dissidents. Uh, they returned back to Egypt in the early 80s, and we were, I, I always say, I was breastfed uh, anti-military sentiments, you know, not military, but the Nasser military mentality. So, but to talk about Tahrir, it's, it, I could take days standing here to share with you the experiences, but I would not be able to convey to you th the spiritualness of, of this experience. Um, but I could talk about the physical evidence of what had happened. Um, you've got the pre-revolution the Tahrir, the pre Tahrir and during the revolution and what's happening right now. Um, Tahrir was extremely policed with the, under emergency law and you couldn't congregate over three people in the same place. And it was uh, the reminiscence of the old socialist uh, you know, policies. We have this big, huge, ugly building for all sorts of ministry offices to provides services for people from all, all over the country. So if you've been there, you have uh, a nasty experience with, with uh, governance, uh, uh, Egyptian bureaucracy, 7,000-year-old bureaucracy. Now, during the revolution, uh, it is what uh, Chantal Mouffe would, uh, would call pluralistic democracy, where all sex groups came together in the same place, uh, inhabited this regardless of their ideological differences. You know, um, just 15 days before the revolution, one of the um, right, uh, radical right-wing Islamists, the Salafis groups, would consider a woman without a scarf or a veil uh, an infidel. But what we saw is those young girls graduated of the American University handing them food and they telling them, thank you, sister. This kind of new bond that was not there between Egyptians for 30 years or more um, was a new bond that was more sp spiritual than uh, political. People understood the value of being one nation at that time. Now, I will talk to you about briefly about um, images from the revolution. I mean, people say it was a Facebook revolution. Uh, it is definitely not. And it was not a youth revolution. It was a popular revolution. Yes, the youth were in the front lines. Yes, they mobilized people. And they used Google, Yahoo, and Twitter, and Facebook to do that. But those were the driving forces. There were some, the tools, but the driving forces were um, political, uh, political underrepresentation, uh, inequality. Uh, lack of access to education and basic services, a lot of things. Now, we also always, uh, you know, uh, I, I can say there was a lot of elbowing of women figures in Tahrir Square, but definitely women stood out. You can see this uh, woman who is uh, a mother of, uh, of many who are already on Tahrir Square, in Tahrir Square, surrounded by all those men, but she stood out and she was fearless. We have all sorts of representation of women, you know, all sorts of backgrounds and educational backgrounds, social backgrounds, uh, speaking out fearless uh, in the face of a very repressive regime. 
for the first time, Egyptians reclaim the public spaces. It's, it's not been in the contemporary history, in the past 30 years, Egyptians never really protested massively uh, unless it's on campus at a university and would not be let out of off campus. But since the revolution of the January 25th, the people were reclaiming public spaces which were controlled and policed by a repressive state apparatus. For example, Tahrir bec has become a global symbol of space reappropriated by the people for expressing and enacting their moral and political agency. The function and meaning of these public spaces are also being contested by different groups. We saw the promo barracks, uh, and as you will see during the camel battle over here, you'll find the promo barracks people trying to attack the masses of Tahrir Square in their camels and mules and horses. But many of those uh, spaces were reoccupied by revolutionary forces. Just the past week, we've heard a lot of losses of life in Abbasiyah Square, which was the center or the capital of the promo barracks. But there was a lot of lessons learned from the Tahrir experience. You know, the, the youngest people were the, the, the bravest. They broke that China wall of fear. And their sacrifices were, were just uh, amazing. They, they inspired young and old men, women, and children to, to sacrifice and rebuild this nation out of the rubble, rubbles of the crony uh, regime of Mubarak. For me, I, I entered Tahrir Square after I mobilized five of my family members and we started uh, a march uh, 20 kilometers away from Tahrir and we marched and until we became 30,000. Uh, I, since that day, became one of the people who were quite often on public television, international television, uh, talking about Mubarak regime and the military council, uh, their pr brutality and, and what the interests are in, in maintaining uh, the status quo. Um, it was governance 101 to me and, and to many people it was pol politics 101, an introduction to governance and politics. We had to mobilize ourselves and our resources, we had to come up with uh, services on, on, uh, uh, on the square. Uh, we, we, we joked about the square being the Independence People Republic of Tahrir Square and uh, how it, was, it, ha it held itself at higher moral grounds. It never really attacked. Yes, it was peaceful re uh, revolution, uh, uh, but it wasn't peaceful at the other end. Uh, the Mubarak regime killed over 1,200 uh, people and had injured over 15,000 people and intentionally targeted eyes. Over 10,000 people lost uh, partially their eyes out or completely. But this rekindled sense of ownership and belonging, you know, uh, this whole uh, you know, movements, it, it, people in Egypt felt for so long disenfranchised and they felt that this is not our country, this is the, the country of Mubarak and his lot and, and, and the Alibaba gang as we call them. Um, many of those who went out on the streets on the 28th felt as if they were reaffirming their sense of belonging and Egyptianness as they have for so long abandoned hope that Egypt will change and be a land of freedom and opportunities for all Egyptians, many of which were from poor disadvantaged communities who had lost all hope and felt their lives were purposeless. And they were so zealous about being in the front lines, sacrificing their lives uh, in an epic heroic scene of valor. It was shocking to see that they were mostly between 12 to 20 and they were simply fearless, which inspired us all. Most importantly was the birth of the societal dialogue. I can't explain to you or describe to you the massive migraines I got the first three days, people would not stop blabbering 24 hours a day about everything. It's, it was an explosion of expression. Arts were quite present uh, in Tahrir Square and in all sorts uh, and various forms. Um, this society, the birth of this societal dialogue was important. There was no dialogue between Egyptians and different religious and ethnic groups. Past issues of marginalization has come to the foreground of politics. The issues of indigenous rights of Nubians and Bedouins has become center stage in many of the presidential programs of almost, the, of almost all the runners. This dialogue has not always been easy. At times, it created tensions. 
as long it, it was an overdue confrontation were surfacing all the time after the fall of Mubarak. But overall, this explosion of expression created an atmosphere of multiplicity and diversity, resulting in the formation of 77 new political parties and over 200 youth coalitions. Although there was a lot of polarization of the Islamic movements, it, uh, it's, it was quite fierce. They were always trying to recruit during this past year and a half uh, and to grow the membership. But it, the, the, the voice of dissidents took a new form. You know, it wasn't the Brotherhood who was the voice of dissidents anymore. It was the, the new left, the rise of a new left in Egypt, uh, young people who are, who are not really political, but they're rights-based. So th this was a, a new thing for us. 68% of the population of Egypt are under 35 years. So you've got a very youthful nation here. The issues of youth involvement in the decision-making structures and empowerment uh, and empowering them to have role in shaping their future has become more challenging than even from the Mubarak regime, forcing the society to confirm their accomplishment as agents of change, yet denying them access to a leading role in the formal establishments and institutions. I personally ran uh, for parliament, but uh, I ran against the only person that the military council wanted in parliament to ensure the uh, entitlements. Uh, women issues have never been at stake as they are now. In the society that is emerging from a state-dominated plan for women, only to glorify the efforts of the first lady, to a society that is trying to fight the demeaning, conflicting stereotypes of the role of women as promoted by the radical right-wing forces dominating the rural areas and now represented in parliament. New forms of activism. Egyptians, for the first time, got engaged on the street level in politics. Families would go to Tahrir to protest. Mothers would cook for those who camped in square. I, I consider those activists as well. Women volunteered as security guards at the checkpoints, nurses, and so on. The life of many young people who became prominent as Tahrir figures changed as they became more and more immersed in this experience. Some ran for parliament, uh, others um, quit their daily jobs and became fully fledged pro democracy and human rights activists. One of the most important achievements of this revolution is that it unmasked the ugliness and corruption and decadence of the Mubarak regime, as well as the military council, which is called SCAF. Um, those establishments were not only corrupt, but they used those to form the corrupt media tools to lie to the nation uh, for so long. They had militias of thugs that, on a daily basis for the past year, have been attacking uh, civilians uh, peacefully demonstrating all in effort to derail this democratic progress and future of this great nation. It also exposed the members of the military council of being marionettes in an obsolete political paradigm whose players are desperately trying to keep their tentacles tight grip over the future and development of the Arab world and the so-called third world at large. We have all heard the baffling early statements coming from the State Department when Mrs. Clinton said uh, that uh, Mubarak is a close ally and that um, they, they believe he has a, a strong, stable country at hand. And then just a week later, they believe that Mubarak should go and that he's uh, uh, archaic and, uh, uh, and should, uh, belong, belongs to a museum or something. Um, also, we also saw Israel listening for the first time, seriously listening to what's going on in the Arab world. They put the settlements on hold for the first time and announced it. For me, this was a clear message to the rest of the Arab world that we're watching and there might be uh, a new game to play. This is the impact of Tahrir Square, both internally and externally. Egypt has opened up its political makeup, is unfolding before the world since the beginning of the revolution. This means that the Muslim Brotherhood and other political forces are playing out their politics under a global gaze. This will no doubt reveal a great deal about the potential and failures of those forces. That would not have been possible before at this level and scale and will lead to deeper structural changes and developments in these political forces, not only in Egypt, but also worldwide. 
this is of a particular, particular significance in the case of political Islam. The revolution and the events of the past year have demystified the legend of the Muslim Brotherhood. and political Islam at large. I, I personally believe that the term political Islam is nothing but a myth, a fallacy. The myth of the Brotherhood's capabilities and agendas has been now both been busted and exposed. People are now more disenchanted with the Brotherhood's inefficiencies and poor performance in Parliament. It also pushed the radical right, or the Salafis, or as I call them, the Salafista, for a lack of a better word to describe them, into reformering and entering the political sphere, competing with the Brotherhood, and posing a real threat on the Brotherhood's ambitions to gain ground and broaden their membership and power. The current development will undermine the claim of political Islamic groups to religious authenticity and will break their monopoly over Islamic discourse in politics. What we are seeing today is a strong wave of contestation coming from ordinary Muslims over the use of religious discourse in Egyptian politics. You, you, you can say that um, this is no longer the case that the Brotherhood holds this monopoly of uh, political Islam and we're the only voice of political Islam. The military council reduced the revolution into tahrir. I mean, there were plenty of other squares in, in Alexandria and in Suez, so, but it, it did so with its media to reduce the revolution into tahrir so that they can defame other people in tahrir whenever they can and the entire revolution. Will the military hand power, this is a very important question, have they hand a power of 60 years? We have a deep state uh, militarized state entrenched in all levels of the society, from the municipal level, the heads of the municipality, the mayor, the heads of the institutions are all retired generals. So it's, it's, we're fighting uh, an octopus here and to, to cut its tentacles. It's not going to happen overnight. But this is the role of the civil society. Uh, a lot of those youth coalitions and movements are becoming parties, but also NGOs, watchdogs. And this is the role of the, the, the existing civil society to resurface and re-emerge as a, an agent of change. Just to wrap up, finally, I see what's happening in Tunisia and Egypt and Libya and Syria, Greece, Spain, Wall Street, and all the Occupy movements, and even the Tenth Revolution in Israel, nothing but an attempt to push back the aggressive neoliberal efforts to dehumanize the world with its catastrophic consumeristic culture imposed on humanity. Those efforts manifest people, people's will around the globe to fight that new world order that for over 20 years now bred nothing but greed, hunger, war, and abuse of all possible human rights in the name freedom of freedom and democracy. People simply had enough People around the world now, through those movements, are trying to remain, to regain their human identity and dignity. But to wrap up, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll share with you a story. Some of, of course, those images, those political statements. You know, people were telling the military, we, we, we got done with the police, which back then was 1.2 million recruits, army is 480. They were just telling the, the military that we are no longer afraid, we are sleeping in your tent, uh, in, in, uh, in your tanks. And you can see the burning of one of the tanks here. So people were trying to tell, send this message to the military at the beginning, uh, although they've tried to use more uh, emotionally blackmailing terms like the people and the military are one hand at the very beginning. And, and this is to change the psyche of the military that they should be on the side of the people. And as you can see, they sprayed Yaskot Mubarak, so down with Mubarak on the tanks. And this also was uh, a message returned from the military to the people at the time, uh, before the fall of Mubarak. They let them do that so that they can say, we're on your side. Of course, images of the, the battle, the perseverance, uh, a lot of people lost their eyesight. And this is this, the square at, at uh, its best. With all Egyptians, period. Not Salafis, Brotherhood, Muslims and Christians. Let me share with you a story. Those couple are the founders of the Revolutionary Monkeys Movement. Um, their mother was telling them a story before they go to sleep. Every night she does that. And uh, the little one had to run to the toilet. So she stopped and the um, 
the seven-year-old told his mom, the people want the story to continue. <laughs> and he looked up at her and he told her, listen, these are protests if you didn't notice. So as cute as this may sound, my seven-year-old and, and, and five-year-old are the future of this revolution. The kids playing around the neighborhood uh, and chanting down with the regime, the people want to punish the field marshal. And, and they play revolution. It's a game now. Let me, <laughs> let me share with you uh, a quick clip. This is an elementary school in the countryside in Egypt. And unfortunately, we don't have the sound here. Oh, it's, it, it's on me. Let me, I'll fix it. All right. Ah, I can see. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. Now, this is an elementary school in countryside Egypt. And the teachers, um, they picked up their phones and recorded this amazing moment. Oops. What they were doing is playing revolution at the, the school yard. And they were chanting the people want the regime uh, to oust Mubarak and down with the regime. People want to oust the field marshal. The teachers were shocked. Sometimes they pretend some of them are uh, soldiers shooting at the revolutionaries and one of the revolutionaries will fall and they start getting him and chanting that the martyrs are the, the loved ones of God. <laughs> this is such an amazing uh, scene because even if we cannot bring all the desired changes immediately, Egypt has changed forever. I went out on the 28th of January uh, to bring a better future for my kids. I kissed them and I told them, and I didn't know if they would understand this, but I hoped if this was my last thing to tell them, that they would understand it sometime later on, that daddy's going out to get you a better future, and I'm prepared to do it at any given time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ahmed. Um, and now over to our last speaker, Laurie Penny, and an occasional technician, as you can see. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Uh, this is a, it's a difficult one to follow, but um, I'll do my best. Uh, I'm Laurie. I've um, been reporting on and following various activist movements, in Lo particularly in London and in the United States for the past two years now. And um, I've just come back, um, given the various time zones, I'm not quite sure what time it is in my body clock right now, but I've, I've just come back from uh, the May Day marches in New York, um, which were incredible, incredible scenes. I don't know if anybody was following what happened on Twitter, or because I know that there's been very little reported um, in the mainstream press over here, particularly about what happened, for example, in Seattle, uh, what happened in Oakland yesterday. Does, any, does everybody know about? Well, there were there were large, huge marches um, across the United States yesterday. There were marches in Spain, Greece, Italy as well, across the world, called for May Day, which was meant to be a global day of action, International Workers' Day. But significantly, May Day has not been International Workers' Day in the United States for many, many years. Instead, they have uh, Labor Day, which is later on. And I think uh, President Obama um, has, uh, is thinking of renaming May Day, designated it, designating it an official holiday called Loyalty Day, which, is, uh, which really says everything you need to know about the way liberal politics is heading in the new United States. Um, so I've just got back from uh, New York where the Occupy movement kicked off in September. And um, I'd like to start off with a little story, since we're talking about the politics of squares, about, about space and about what space means. Because I was thinking about the idea of the politics of squares and what, and what the taking of physical space has symbolised for people over the last two years, but particularly since Tahrir Square. 
Um, so yesterday at the big union rally, um, there, some people from Greece took the stage and they said, we are Syntagma Square, we are Tahrir Square, we are Liberty Park, we are Puerta del Sol, we are Trafalgar Square. And I was just like, uh, when you said, uh, who are you calling Square? I was like, I want that on a T-shirt now. We're Terrier Square, we're Syntagma Square. <laughs> Where's the who are you calling Square? I don't know, maybe it's like modern revolution. I just think in T-shirts all the time. <laughs> but but um, it's, I found that really, really interesting. And it's been a theme from the start of these quote unquote global revolutions is that much as governments like our own are absolutely keen to underline their anxiety that the patterns of resistance not be linked up, people on the ground are seeing these things as very, very similar, almost like a kind of sympathetic magic that's taking place. You know, one square here, one square there. The idea, I mean, it's very, very naive and childish in some ways, but quite beautiful, the idea that you could have various little squares, pockets of public space lighting up all over the world, like a network. Uh, some theorists got very, very carried away with this idea at the start, I'm not going to lie. Very, very excited. The word rhizome was used too much. Um, but I want to show you some... First, this video. Um, it's long, so I'm just going to play you a little bit. Um, this is uh, Occupy Wall Street, um, a video that was made uh, in October uh, about, about the movements. And it. Um we call for the immediate release of all who have been unjustly detained. And I'm confident that history will be on the side of those who seek justice. This looking familiar to you. <laughs> Taken from all over the world, from Tunisia, Libya, Egypt, and America. Americans are not subtle, <laughs> which is one thing I've learned from being over there for the last three months. And actually, the fact that Americans are not subtle and not very good at irony is one of the things that's allowed them to take these movements, looking brilliant, um, allowed them to take these movements further than they might otherwise have gone. Um, the idea, so that's, that, that little clip for me is about the power of an idea of global change, of reclaiming public space, Tahrir Square, Syntagma Square, Trafalgar Square, and also about the power of film, which I'm going to come on to later, because this piece is obviously, it's not just shot camera on a stick, this is carefully edited, the clips are carefully selected to make a very simple, obvious point. Um, so I'd like to speak a little bit about Zuccotti Park, which has several names. Um, it's a space between Cedar Street and Liberty Street in downtown Manhattan. Some people call it Zuccotti Park. Some people call it Liberty Plaza or Liberty Square. Uh, some people call it Occupy Wall Street. And um, some people insist on calling it home, which I find delightful still. Um, right now, it's ringed by barricades and police. And, um, but the legislation behind that space, which happened to be where the original Occupy Wall Street camp set up, originally they planned to set up down the street, they came there after being moved on by police, but it turned out that that was an interesting place for them to set up because there's New York public ordinance law, and bear in mind that New York is one of the most densely populated places in the world, Manhattan is tiny. And it's one of the most, it's one of the most cult culturally dense pieces of real estate there is. And back in the 60s, um, the 
plan, new planning laws came in which allowed people to build more and more skyscrapers. But in return, the companies that were developing these skyscrapers, like, for example, uh, One Liberty Plaza, which is owned and built by Brookfield Industries, which owns Zuccotti Park, in return for being uh, able to cut round some planning regula regulations, they had to build little parks. And Zuccotti Park is one of those parks. There are, and so there are now little parks all over the city which I exist in this strange hinterland of being simultaneously private property and public space. They have to be public space. The people who, clo people who own them can't shut them down. So the occupation there existed in a very weird space of planning laws. And, and when, um, when the police were trying very, very hard to evict them, everybody's saying, well, who owns them? Who owns this space? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. It's a really good question. <laughs> who owns this? And again, who owns this psychic territory? Who owns the space of the public commons? Because the commons is the word that I think we really need to start coming back to here. Um, and again, weirdly enough, exactly the same thing happened with St Paul's. Because um, when the St Paul's occupation uh, got, was set up, uh, everybody was, no, I mean, nobody expected there to suddenly be a refugee camp on the steps of St. Paul's. Although, by the way, nothing quite says crisis of capital like refugee camps suddenly springing up in all the major global metropolises of the world. I mean, I just want to put that out there. Uh, but because this wasn't a situation anybody had anticipated, it was just a bare bit of land, when people came to look at precisely who owned that little strip of land. It was so old, and there had been so many different people owning the different chunks that actually nobody knew who owned it. And that was one of the reasons that nobody spoke out about it for like a week or so, because that space, nobody actually knew. Everybody just assumed that it was someone's private property and nobody could go on to it. And nobody could go on to it. I mean, I know I'm, I'm running it. I'm, I'm trying to pace myself. but Because um, there's this, lots of points I want to get through. But um, the idea of public space versus private space is what's going on. It's going on in a territorial fashion, but it's also going on in a psychological fashion. The idea, the simple idea of common land and common dreams and the human experience, which is what we were talking about earlier, reclaiming some kind of human experience from the domination of neoliberal culture and neoliberal economic lifestyles. It's, um, sorry, I've been up for 36 hours because of the plane, so please forgive me. But um, it's, Karl Marx calls this idea original accumulation, whereby land was enclosed, and what we're taught about in the UK is, uh, the sh is land enclosed by sheep farmers, is the classic simple example, where land own owners would come and just fence off land and take it, and this being the root of the exploitative nature of private property and social and, um, and private capital. But you don't have to go into Marx to understand that there's less and less room today. There's less and less room for young people to live. There's less and less room for anyone to live. There is less money. There's less space. And a lot of people have come out onto the streets across the world, but particularly in places where I've had experience of in America, in the UK, because they felt this lack of space. They've wanted to create space for themselves and sort of push, push back and wrest it back from people. And they've met with an extraordinary amount of resistance, an extraordinary amount of violence. And I'll put my hand up to admit to being one of those naive middle-class white kids who really didn't expect to get beaten up by the cops as much as that just for sitting around in some tents. I mean, it's just been extraordinary. And some of the, one of the ways you can tell class divisions down at Occupy Wall Street, uh, Zuccotti Park, whatever you want to call it, um, is the difference between the people who are utterly shocked when the police start coming in with their sticks and the, police, and the people who aren't shocked at all. And um, you can generally tell by uh, what colour people's skin is, whether or not they're going to, particularly Amer in America, whether or not they're going to expect to be beaten up by the police or not, which says something else very deep, particularly about American culture. Um, the idea of enclosure is very important. It's one that's been brought up a lot, particularly in the UK where we have uh, people brought up heritage of the, the, digger, the diggers and the free levellers, the idea of taking back public land, taking back common land, but taking back territorial, taking back psychological space is equally important, and that's where the internet comes in, although I, I also like, um, 
I think it's very, very simplistic and naive to talk about uh, the internet as an instigator, Twitter as an instigation of, instigator of revolution. I mean, I think they were having revolutions before Twitter, if you look at history. That <laughs> happened at, at Lenin, <laughs> lol, 1917, good day, <laughs> sleep now. <laughs> but um, I wanted to show you a um, little bit of footage from yesterday. This was, this was yesterday in Seattle, and this is what you haven't heard about in the news. Let's go back a little bit. Um, this is what they did. I'm going to use my cursor because there's something, there's something I want you, I'm going to want you to look at in a minute. So you need to pay attention. This is about 200 anarchists using the black bloc tactic, smashing up for some reason the Nike world. Smashing windows there. Um, I can only imagine what it's like and for those newscasters being say, very, very shocked. Oh, yeah. But there are, there are, there are also um, are there are protesters in Seattle yeah. using a variety yeah. of different tactics, can you hear me? Yep. and mainly targeting <laughs> banks, big financial Seattle institutions. There's the cop with his pepper spray, of, uh, indiscriminately into the crowd. For some reason, that look, for some reason, the police in Seattle ride bikes, which I find like bicycles, which I find really, really funny. Here, this guy, look, what's he doing? Pay attention to what he's doing. Apart from being bullied. Trying to get a to get my bicycle up in your face. <laughs> This protester down the sidewalk, like that. as a group of photographers are behind these like officers, that. he's got a phone. He's got a phone and he's holding it up, um, almost like a weapon. Situation as and he won't stop holding it. And the police person, and the police officers. Officers. I watched this half an hour before I came here because With somebody sent me these updates. And I thought this was fascinating. Right Look. Now. What are they afraid of? What is it that they're afraid of? Why are they going after this guy? And why is he not running away? There we go. That little flashpoint I thought was massively interesting in terms of psychological reclamation of space. I saw chalked on the street at Occupy Wall Street two weeks ago, we're occupying the media. Facebook, Twitter, I'm not sure about Facebook either. I mean, just saying. Mark Zuckerberg is not your friend. But anyway, Facebook, Twitter, Twitter, uh, somebody put email, YouTube, particularly YouTube. Um, we're taking back the psychological space from the mainstream media. It's not about not wanting to be seen, it's about wanting also to have the power of seeing. That, that gesture is that for our generation. It's that. It's with a phone. Everybody now has a camera phone, and I don't believe for one second the bullshit um, neoliberal argument that if you have a camera phone you can't be oppressed. Sorry. There are now, there are now lots and lots of people for whom buying a, sh buying a phone is more important than buying shoes, and that's fantastic. Um, but the creation of media, the creation of an alternative way of seeing and being seen is just as important as the taking back of public, of public space. Because the taking back of public space is one thing the cops know how to deal with, and you can see them dealing with it right there. Um, but the taking back of cultural territory is something that the police have no way of dealing with yet. The state has no way of dealing with yet. Um, the o they only understand surveillance that works in one way. You can see this, this happening in Egypt. You can see it happening in Libya, in Tunisia. You can't see it happening in Syria because it's very, very hard to get footage out of Syria, but people are still trying. You can see it particularly in America, in Oakland, for example, where people are taking footage of uh, people being attacked by tear gas. Just yesterday, things happened in Oakland as well. Things happened in San Francisco. Just go on the internet, Google yesterday's date, San Francisco, Oakland, <coughs> Seattle, and New York, and you'll find out things that just aren't being reported in the mainstream press. And I, I don't want to come all, all over all conspiracy theorists here, because I know how news cycles work, and sometimes you just can't fit the stories in. But I think it's very significant what people choose not to report. And the police are very, very afraid of that. And, they've now, and they don't know quite how to deal with it. And one thing I've noticed over the last year is that they will now beat up people for holding a phone. I saw my friend John Neffel, who is a photojournalist and comedian, um, last December, I think it was, standing there with a phone like that, standing, not doing anything with his hands, as the police beat up someone and took them away in another Brookfield property zone square somewhere else in New York. And 
Five cops grabbed him, knocked his glasses off, threw his phone and took him away and arrested him. Actually, he just got his charges dropped yesterday, which is fantastic. It's all over the news. Well done, John. But it's, that kind of thing is happening more and more. It's no longer safe to be a person observing. And whilst I think there's also, um, there's also uh, good reason for people to say, put your phone down sometimes and do something that's not observed, it's... I wanted to bring that idea of cultural reoccupation back into the idea of civil society, and I, I hope we could talk about that more in the questioning period. I, had, I did have more to talk about, about police violence, but I think I've run over my time. So if we can, maybe if, if you have any questions to ask, ask me, that'd be great. Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you. In, the, in the spirit of Occupy, hand it over to you. Um, and uh, and uh, please put your hands up. I think I'll take uh, maybe a couple questions at a time. And please do say who you are. Thank you. The woman in the front. Thank you. There's, there's a microphone for you. Carlotta Perez. I'm a visiting scholar now with Mary here in LSC. Um, I'd like you to say in what sense you think civil society is global? Is it because they're doing the same thing in countries? Or is there something globalizing going on? What's the real meaning of the notion of global civil society? I think actually this, this question can stand alone and you might all have something to say about it. So um, Mary Helmut, would you like to have a, have a shot? You don't want to take a second? Okay. Uh, well, it's, it's a huge question which we've endlessly debated and which different people have different answers. So I'm going to give you my answer. I don't think global is about interconnectedness. I think global is a word we use to describe the times we're living in. And I think what's very interesting is that the word civil society and the word global entered the political lexicon in the same period. And if I try to put my fingers on what it is, I think it has to do with this, what I said several times, getting around the nation state, getting around the blockage of the nation state. So it might be that somebody acting very locally, it doesn't, doesn't even need to have a global connection, would be something so for me it means something about in these times and i think one of the criticisms that you know at the beginning in the first few years we organized lots of debates with our colleagues especially in international relations and government who were, thought this was a utopian and and one of the objections was you can't have civil society without a state and actually the state and civil society sort of constituted each other. The civil society needs a rule of law and it needs a state to guarantee the rule of law. But in order to have an effective rule of law, you need a civil society to keep a state accountable. And I think what's happening is, just as sort of civil society and the state emerge together, what we're having now is a process of global governance and global civil society emerging together. And of course, the state's part of that, but it's something different. So we're seeing the development of international law, uh, and we're seeing activists make use of, for instance, human rights norms that are global. Um, and in a way, if you like, global civil society and global co governance are kind of constituting each other. So that's my answer. Oh, would you like to? Yeah, uh, very add briefly, to I, I think global civil society is not a very good term. Because <laughs> uh, it, uh, it, it is really a testimony to a very impoverished uh, nomenclature we have in the social sciences to refer to anything that is not nation state based. We, we get into trouble. Uh, we talk about international, transnational, and what is beyond transnational is the global. But there is not much global about global civil society. At best, you see clusters of transnationality. Um, in different parts of the world, and uh, they tend to be in Europe and in the United States and a bit in bits of Asia and uh, in Latin America, and much of the world is very empty when it comes to global civil society. But at the core of it is a uh, really uh, a need to have better terms for what social formations are possible and are emerging beyond the nation state. Thank you. Um, 
So I will take a couple at this point. Um, young woman in front with a scarf. Thank you so much, Arisa Lutsevich. I'm Cha um, Chatham House Fellow, and I'm Ukrainian myself. And I must say it has been quite emotional to see all these uh, pictures from Tahir Square. It was reminding me my revolution in 2004 in Ukraine. And with this regard, I have two questions. One is more theoretical, and perhaps you can, either of you, answer. How do you really measure the strength of civil society? You know, there have been different, I guess, ideas about how to do it, numbers of NGOs, membership of citizens and NGOs. But I think that there has to be some more thinking about how do we really know whether the civil society is strong, where is it moving, uh, because very often some of the indicators we have, it's, it's mostly measuring the attitude of the states, whether it's legislative environment or tolerance, towards uh, civil society instead of looking more deeper into the society itself. So one question on the strengths. And another one, whether you in Egypt and, and you in London, um, in, in UK, we, we all are facing these movements where people are protesting, these are the protest movements, which have different goals, whether to topple a regime, a neoliberal regime, or a totalitarian regime, but what is coming after? Once this immediate goal is over, we have a feeling that we lack the instruments to finish our revolutions. We, uh, we uh, can reach the change of elites. But how do we really ensure that the citizens are included, that they are empowered? And, and I think that this is the question to you. Do, are you thinking about it? Thank you. That's an excellent question. Thank you. I'm going to take the question from the young woman in the back with the long hair. Um, I'm Saskia. I'm a student here at LSE doing a master's. Um, I had a question for Ahmed, and thank you very much for your presentation. Um, it was really inspiring. Um, I personally think, reflect sometimes, but how can civil society actors be most effective in their efforts? Um, it requires coordination, it requires communication, and civil society is very effective in guiding citizen action and shaping um, public opinion as well. Um, but for that, you also need informed citizens, and you need kind of like an architecture or a culture of learning. Um, so I wanted to ask what's, what's taking place in Egypt, basically. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Mary Helmut, would you like to comment on the measuring the strength of civil society? Yeah. It's Helmut's job <laughs> in, our, in our collaboration. <laughs> but I think at the beginning, we started, we did a lot to measure NGOs. <coughs> And then we came to the conclusion that that was what we call now the neoliberal version <laughs> of civil society. And it wasn't, if, if we think of civil society as a space, and I really loved what, everything Laurie said about spaces where people can engage with each other and engage with public affairs, that's what, to me, civil society is. What does it mean to measure it? Um, I mean, we thought measurement's important because it's what gives social science concepts legitimacy. <laughs> um, but I've increasingly come to the conclusion that what's really interesting is events, happenings. And, you know, you'll see in this yearbook and the last few yearbooks, we've had some beautiful maps. You know, there's a lovely map which Robin pointed out yesterday of austerity protest, anti-austerity protest. So, <laughs> so I think events and happenings gives you the idea because we're really talking about a process rather than numbers of organization and numbers of people. Oh, did, would, you, would you like to first? Yeah, please. Oh, um, partly I was gonna say that in terms of what is being built of, uh, in, in terms of civil society that's being built through these movements, Many of them, it's not quite as hopeful as that. Um, I think it's often about defence. Um, unless a, it, apart from movements which are specifically out there to topple a dictatorship or to get rid, or, or to get rid of a specific public figure, like for example in Wisconsin, they're trying to get rid of their governor who's been uh, enacting anti-union laws. But in the UK, for example, what constitutes civil society? What con constitutes the commons? Education, healthcare. Uh, uh, welfare, that's all being
being attacked, and a lot of the movements, a lot of the anti-austerity mm. protests are out there simply to protect what we have, because people, partly through joining these movements and partly out of a sense of desperation, have realised that we do still have a, some vestige of civil society and that we need to protect it. Being involved in, for example, the Occupy movements has been an experience a little bit, a little bit like sort of totemic magic, where you go to, have people been down to Occupy London or any of the Occupy camps? Anybody here? Yeah. Well, you'll see there's like there's a little kitchen, there's a little, a little medical tent. It's like people have made little wooden dollies of the things that they want to see in a bigger society, in a free space for everyone, <coughs> and, and, and made that happen. And, but it's a hope at the moment, and it's a defensive hope, and it's very, very fragile. And people and people making theory are investing a lot of a lot of hope and energy in it. And I think people don't realise how fragile and defensive it is. And before I, I'll hand on to you, but the other thing I wanted to say is, in terms of society being global and in terms of civil society being constructed, I think rather than a recognition that society is global, what's happened first, and this particularly important, both in London and in America. It, it, and it, London and New York, America and the UK, is that um, it's a rejection of representative democracy. Um, the video I didn't have time to show you was a video um, that somebody mashed up between Nick Clegg speaking and footage of the London riots and footage of the student riots, because both in America and here, and to some extent, although the process has been longer in Spain, France and Greece, there's been... Uh, period of immense elation, immense excitement that something was finally going to change within the representative democratic process we have, and then immense disappointment in Obama. Um, I remember one of my first weeks in Occupy Wall Street, I found um, somebody, had donated, somebody had donated a big bin full of Obama 08 sweaters, which I thought for me was rather symbolic. And on marches, I've heard people shouting Trayvon Martin. I've heard people shouting Sean Bell. I've heard people shouting Martin Luther King. I have not heard people shouting Barack Obama. And that is significant. People are, re people are rejecting representative democracy, and that's the first step in a process of seeing that, as other people on this panel have said, the nation state can no longer deliver justice in a world where capital and the mechanisms of exploitation are global. Yes. Uh, um, well, I, I don't know. I, I'm not. I'm not so sure that uh, it's a rejection of uh, representative democracy. It's. It's more kind of the current state of what is uh, going on or has been going on in some countries, and typically uh, what people are saying: we want true and more representative democracy, and we just see that we have the wrong elites in charge. But it's different from saying. Actually, that, I want to add because this came out, and I think I can. And this came out, we, we've just done a study of subterranean politics and we went and did lots of interviews in squares and other things and how much was done. And I think what in fact was so interesting about it is I would say it was about representative democracy in its current form. I mean, what was so interesting was that we thought these were demonstrations against austerity. And of course, that's the background. But even in Germany, where there wasn't any austerity, this was happening. And what people all said is actually what Laurie just said. I mean, they said, uh, we're fed up with the current political elites and the sort of link between political elites and capital and corruption. And we're fed up with democracy as it's currently practiced. Uh, we want democracy, but not like this. So we want transparency of decision making. We want you know, we want the democracy that we practice in the squares. And one of the things that I find so interesting is that an awful lot of the criticism of the squares is, oh, they don't have an agenda. I mean, of course, it's different in Egypt because you had the agenda of toppling Mubarak. But um, actually, the whole point is not the agenda. The whole point is the process. Which, but the, pro the process is participatory democracy, which is it's directly... Which is, not, which is not representative mm. democracy. Re a pr having a problem with representative democracy is not the same thing as having a problem with democracy. Exactly. Although you are right that many people, as people have felt more and more under attack, people started off by the, the practice of participatory democracy, all the hand signals, all that stuff, um, and have moved on to just saying, we just want representative democracy that does want what it says on the tin. We want representative mm. democracy that actually yes. represents. 
and, and so some, some reject, some just, just want it to do what it says. I think what's also interesting, just very quickly on this, is that there are a number of people who are protesting without going to the squares. And there are, there are a growing number of these. There are the 20% the, the, the of people who vote for Marine Le Pen, for example. Um, there are the 16% of people who vote for Geert Wilders or who vote for the Dutch uh, Socialist Party. And these people are not occupying squares, but they are, in very many ways, making the same statement about representative democracy. Um, not just holding the elites to account, but the sneaking suspicion that representative democracy cannot deliver um, you know, what is required for, uh, for, for populations in, in, in a world where nation states perhaps can no longer deliver this in, in the same way. So what's interesting is also it's all the people who are not on the squares but who are also sending a very firm signal. Um, now that can be reduced to xenophobia, fear of immigration, but the interviews that, that we've done as part of a project I'm running suggest that there's a lot more to it than that and it's actually not that dissimilar from those people who've given up on representative democracy and taken to squares. They may want they may want a different end game, but they are very, very cr critical of de representative democracy. But I, th yeah, well, oh, maybe Sorry. Laurie should come in. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I understand. Uh, can I, can I just maybe ask mm. that, like, after this, I think like a lot of people want to speak. Yeah. So, like, uh, maybe we should give them a long chunk of time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh wait, oh wait, oh wait. And I think it's, but like, um, I'm not sure that na nationalism as a response to globalization is an understandable gut instinct, but I don't think it's protest. I don't think it's the same thing at all. And yes, there are people, I, you know, I've met a lot of different people of a lot of different political backgrounds down at protests. I mean, yesterday I was chatting to somebody in New York who was a 9-11 a first responder. People have been coming down from the World Trade Center site who were just next door visiting it, saying, we are patriots, we want to do this. But nationalism and xenophobia are not a part of it. They're not a part of it. They never will be a part of what's happening. And they are, I don't see it as, it's the politics of protest and not the politics of fear. And that's the politics of fear and people taking yes. advantage of it. So I, 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 re I reject that statement with respect. <laughs> <laughs> Taken as such. I, I'm gonna hand over to you because right. you had questions. Well, I'm, I'm gonna try to merge all the questions because they more or less are interrelated. Um, if we talk about civil society, this, this is uh, a serious question because how do you f define civil society? There's a generation that defines civil society as the NGOs and the parties and, and those uh, in institutions providing uh, alternative services to, to the existing uh, establishments. Uh, but with, with this Arab awakening, I don't like to call it spring, we have a new form of civil society. We have the people on the street, the, the party, the third party that was missing from the equation for such a long time, they are saying, this is what we want and this is what we want it now, not when we do not re-elect you four years later. So, and whether it's uh, effective, impactful, uh, how do we measure it? It's whether it fulfills the social demands or not, whether it meets the expectations uh, of, on the grassroots level or not. So, for instance, uh, civil society can be effective, in, in, it depends on the stage, uh, uh, the needs of this phase or stage. For instance, in Egypt, we need to mobilize people, yet there are people on the different, uh, f uh, uh, in the food chain, they are in, in different, uh, you know, positions. In, in the United States, you have more informed decisions, uh, informed citizens, pardon me, and, and in Egypt, you have 49% of, uh, uh, of illiterate uh, people, 49% of the nation is illiterate. So, uh, you know, we're on different speed shifts. However, what we all want at the end of the day is to regain that human dignity, the, the, the representation that truly meets the demands. So we want the same thing. We're on the different level or scales of, uh, on the food chain. Um, let me tell you something. I believe that we are the products, my generation is a product of the 60s generation that had a dream for, for humanity. You know, th this whole psychedelic hippie culture uh, w wasn't just uh, for entertainment. It had a dream, there was a dream, but there was no vision. They had a dream of peace and love, uh, but it, it, it did not really culminate in, in, in anything physical except some reforms, societal reforms, but not structural reforms 
uh, necessarily. And, and I think the real culmination of those efforts is our generation. We are the real fruit or product of this project. Now, we're a little bit different. We're a little bit advanced in the game. We know what we want. We have the vision, but not necessarily, we don't necessarily know how to get there. That's the problem. We know we want a greener uh, uh, planet. We know uh, we need to redu reduce those carbon impacts. We know we, we don't want this uh, uh, demo uh, democratic uh, false practices and false promises, but we don't know exactly how to get there. That's the, the, that's the difference. But at least we're ahead in the game right now. Uh, we can hold our governments accountable. It's no more... Uh, 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 a situation whereby uh, you, you take it or leave it. It's not an option. We want this and we want it now. Uh, that's why we see uh, with the austerity plans in Greece, three or four times the government will present those austerity measures at the people yet go out on the streets because, because they will not accept it as is. There are no <coughs> guarantees that they will fulfill those uh, popular demands. So. Let me just simplify it for those uh, you know, American pop culture lovers. Um, I think it's, again, we're in different stages uh, in different parts, but it's at, at places like Occupy Wall Street, it's, it's the same as just telling uh, the Matrix, Neo telling the Matrix that he's there, he's out there to get it. Um, and concerning the issue of nation state not delivering, it definitely the nation states are not delivering because it's the Fortune 500 that is ruling the world. Thank you. Thank you. I've got, um, I've got lots of hands, but um, the gentleman there and then the gentleman in the yellow shirt. Why don't you just take it? And I'll take a whole bunch. And then we can all yeah, yeah. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Will Hall, I've studied here um, vis a vis the OU and the National Gallery Art History. Um, we can go back. Well, we've got this gentleman here to 1517, I think. And there was another revolu revolution then. And it was when um, Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to that church in Wittenberg, I think it was. But then it was a passive revolution because we'd had a printer uh, for five or six decades, the Gutenberg Press, and it was the sort of Blackberry of its day. And the word spread all across uh, Europe and it beca became the Reformation. Now you can fast forward to Gandhi who implored his people not to use violence and he liberated India just after the Second World War. Now we had riots here last year there and a lot of people out there feel disenfranchised in the world, you know, as a whole. The population is due to rise to 10.7 million by 2050. We're running out of resources. The climate's changing, we're getting warmer. You know, some, this gentleman is right, we just don't know which way to go. Is it peaceful or fine? Thank you. Um, young, the young man there, yeah, with the beard, and then... Hi, my name's John. Um, I'm also a master's student here. Um, picking up on what um, you just said, um, and this is a question for Ahmed. Um, you were talking about Egypt um, reclaiming um, the, the things that are happening in Egypt being about reclaiming human dig dignity, but also you referred to um, rediscovering what it was to be an, as a nation, to be a people. Um, and but yet also talk of global problems. Um, and it seems to me that the, the demands or um, demands to, um, to be seen to say that they know what they don't know of all the different um, movements that are happening in squares at the moment um, are for very different reasons. Um, yet, um, and, and sorry, and, then, and they also seem to be concentrated on quite national, quite local issues, um, with the exception probably of Occupy, which is focused on, on more global things, but the, I think the working groups um, and the, um, the assemblies are about um, usually national issues. Um, how does that, if you'll excuse the pun, square with um, the idea of um, the um, nation um, in Egypt, um, and yet the problems that we're facing are global, and they're in reaction to um, the kind of double democratic deficit and so on? That's, that's Thank you. Thank you very much. I need to take, I've got two more hands that went up. I've got the gentleman with the beard. Can I ask you to keep these 
brief so that then I can give everybody a chance to answer. Yeah, go ahead. Hi there. Um, my name is Michael, and I'm one of the editors of the Occupy Times, which is the newspaper that came out of the Occupy London movement. Um, I, from my own um, personal experience and from my the readings that I've done about what's been uh, going on, I would say that as, as disparate um, a movement as Occupy is, and, and how as sort of hard to define as it is, um, the most uh, common things that I've noticed in almost every person that I've met has been uh, an alienation um, with neoliberal culture and um, just a, a general sort of, I mean, it, it's no coincidence that all of, in all of these squares and occupations you'll find some of the most sort of outcast type people from, from uh, Western society, people with mental health problems, people who are homeless, uh, people who have had come from um, abusive families. Um, it's, I feel that these things are only going to increase, but why, my question would be, um, I, th I think that the most important thing right now is to know is how do we um, have sustained change? Because we found that there are limits to um, occupations. Um, we found that, that they can be crushed uh, by the state. I would like to know what people on the panel believe are the, the strongest tactics and strategies for uh, really overthrowing um, neoliberal ideology. Okay, great. Very good question. Okay, I'm going to take... I'm going to take... We'll give you a free newspaper if you get it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I'm going to take one more question, and it's a lot for my panel to... Um, the gentleman in the front sure. right there. Um, Hello. Um, yeah, um, should I go? Yes. No. No, go ahead. Okay, right, sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, my name is Dominic. I'm studying a um, master's degree here at LSE as well. Um, I'm just a little bit worried that we might be uh, precluding some groups from, you know, uh, legitimate protest on kind of normative grounds here. We were talking before about um, Geert Wilders and, uh, you know, the far right um, movements in Europe and, you know, the True Finn Party and so on. Um, I, I don't, or even the EDL, I mean, surely we can't say, but even because we don't agree with these people, uh, or, or, you know, you, people might, but uh, that, that they aren't, this isn't a legitimate form of protest. Uh, I'm not sure, um, I just want a bit of explanation on what the logic is there for saying that they aren't protesting. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay, the, the woman in the back has such a sad face um, <laughs> that I am just gonna have to let her have the last question. <laughs> Thank now you, you feel um, better. <laughs> it will be quick. Um, Lizzie, um, I'm also a part editor of the Occupy Times and I'm an anthropology student at UCL. And uh, I'm just sort of curious about what the panel thinks, to the extent to which this is really a Western protest or sort of mostly Western. I mean, all the squares tend to be in Western Europe. There are, you know, we've, we sparked off Egypt, but... Um, there's very little talk about Latin America, there's very little talk about India and about sort of other forms of organization in civil society elsewhere in the world and whether how that you see that as connected to the Occupy movement. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, okay, I'm going to give uh, my panels two, two, me two minutes each and I'm going to start in reverse order. So. <laughs> media focus than anything else. Because yes, there is stuff happening in Chile. Yes, there is a lot of stuff happening in China that you can find out about if you dig, but there's a lot of there's a lot of censorship going on. I mean China, an entire village rioted oh, sorry, an entire town of about five hundred thousand people uh, rioted and took took the town about a month ago and nearly nobody heard about it because almost no one could get in. It's a difference in distribution of reporting, a difference in focus. The media, the, the mainstream press in particular, is much more interested in what 10 people do in lower Manhattan than what 100,000 people do in Italy. That's just what happens. It's not even a problem with West, uh, West versus not Western. It's a problem with different parts of the West, the English-speaking West, white parts of the West. It's, um, and yes, there are problems 
there are problems of race and gender within these movements, which we haven't even discussed, which we don't have time to discuss. Um, um, in terms of, I w there are lots and lots of interesting questions, but um, in terms of nationalism, there was a question about nationalism. There was a question about what is protest and why is, wh I think it was about when I said that the EDL, the far right movements are not part of the same, Mo uh, they're not. They're not. The they're not the reverse. They're not just the dark flip side of what's happening within the Occupy movement. I think it's, it, it makes a good story if they are, but and that's a simplistic way of looking at it. It's about fear versus hope. We are. At, we are in the middle of a massive crisis of capital worldwide. We're in a. Mis when we're in the middle of a crisis of resources, a crisis of alienation worldwide, globalization, <laughs> and we have a choice. We have a choice between fear and hope. And on the one hand, people have this very strong emotional reaction to throw out anything they're frightened of, to go back to old, what they see as old ways of doing things, traditional ways of doing things, to react against what is only a half art articulated idea of what globalization is doing by becoming ultra-nationalist, by becoming um, fiercely, fiercely uh, xenophobic, um, often incorporates hatred towards other people who are seen as different queers, disabled people, women, people from different ethnic backgrounds within nation states. And I do not see that, I don't see that as protest at all. I see that as redactivism, I see that as deeply, deeply, I'm not going to use the word counter-revolutionary because it's awful, but you know what I mean. And if I can... Um, if people will allow me to quote Ulrika Meinhof, who actually wrote some quite useful things before she went nuts. Um, the difference between protest and resistance, which is what is just beginning to happen, is that protest is when someone says, this is when Ulrika Meinhof wrote, protest is when I say, I do not like what is happening. That's not in my name. Protest is not in my name, and we all know where that leads. Resistance is when you say, I will not allow this to happen. I'll do everything in my power to prevent this from happening. Resistance is what happened in Tahrir Square. Resistance is, what happening, is what's happening in the Arab Spring. Resistance is what's just starting to happen in the UK, in the US, I hope. Resistance is not what you see when the EDL march in the streets, drunk, trying to beat up kids in the East End. I'm sorry, it makes me very, very angry. That is not protest. That's thuggery and violence. And that's the difference. That's, that's the thuggery and violence in our society, and I want no part of it. I don't want it to be called part of this beautiful, beautiful movement that I've been re reporting on for two years. No, no. Away. Right. Over to you. Well, of course, everyone's got a, a right to protest, but what moral grounds do you hold when, when you go for those protests? The people in Tahrir, the people in Sandegma, the people in Occupy Wall Street. They've had those moral grounds. They just won't, uh, they, they've had enough with, with all the ailments of the world uh, because of this new world order that uh, we've been suffering from. Um, so so it, it's an issue of the moral ground you're on when, when you protest. But the issue of focus, focusing on the local uh, rather than the global, um, it's, it, if you, know more about Egypt's role in the 60s and the 70s, you'll understand predominantly Nasser's external foreign policy was, um, was very present in Africa and in the, all the liberation movements of Africa. Egyptians feel that loss of it, not of significance, but role. It's not about prestige, but it's, it's the project to deliver something to humanity. I mean, uh, you know, from the first days of the ancient Egyptians to now, Egyptians always have this sense of purposefulness. We always want to contribute to humanity. We always, uh, you know, criticize ourselves because we uh, are still talking about our past glories of building pyramids and hospitals and discovering, uh, you know, sciences, but we're living in the past. And that's why we, there's this huge gap or hole in our hearts that we need to fill this part. We need to play this role uh, in the region. You know, uh, there's a lot of talk about how the shift of paradigms in, in, in the politics of the region will change. If Egypt becomes the player, it should be again the balance of power 
uh, this virtual war between Sunni Shiites in, in the West and Iran is nothing but an attempt to uh, start an armed race in the region and to, to decrease the, def the budget deficits in the US. So when a player like Egypt gets into uh, the game, it, it, it creates a, a shift in the paradigm, whether it still sides with the US foreign policy or defies it or becomes more of a, a Turkish model where I'm, I'm with you on issues and I'm, I'm, I'm against you on issues. I'm with you all the way, but not necessarily on Israeli issues. This is the role that Egypt always um, looks up for. We, we want to be that player. We want always to, to be uh, in the region having a say in what happens. And in, in, in Egyptian politics, uh, much of the frustrations of the masses was because of the, this long-lasting conflict between the Arabs and Israelis. Egyptians cannot wake up every day uh, while their brothers are being killed across the borders and even be part of the blockage against them. This has frustrated Egyptians so much. So it was part of the uprise, not necessarily the, the drive, but it was a reason. Just to wrap up, um, the fear versus hope, it, it is, this is why I ended with my last slide, this message of hope. We need to replace that fear. Uh, there's a great PBS, BBC Corporation uh, documentary called The Rise of the Politics of Fear. I advise you to watch it. They start with Leo Strauss on one end and Sayyid Qutb at one, uh, at one end. And they go up to Bin Laden and Bush uh, on both panels. And they're both, the, the, yeah, the, they're both uh, two faces of the same coin. Now, last but not least, you know, we, we, the, the 60s generation was out there to get the man. We're out there to get the corporations. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> the man is the corporation. <laughs> well, well don't, don't count me in. I think it's uh, one of the, the difficulties in observing what is going on in different protest movements is, it, it, is how diverse they are and that they take very different starting points and they have different stories to tell. And uh, just within one, uh, one country that I've observed recently, it, it, you, you have the... Uh, you have the Occupy movement in, in, in Germany, but it, it, it tells a, a very incurred story. It, uh, it, it is so different from the Occupy movement that you observe here at, or in the US. You have, however, a very successful party that uh, came out of nowhere, the Pirates. The but pirates. the Pirates have a very, very different story. They have very little to do, and I may be wrong, huh, with what goes on in the Middle East. There's, I think there's a political disconnect. And then you've got this upper-middle-class, well-to-do movement that challenges what are really democratic, legitimated planning processes in, in a city in the south of the country. Um, how do you bring that all together? And I think the only answer, at least that I came up with, is that uh, we seem to have somewhat of a breakdown in a consensus on how to move forward uh, with, and I'm only speaking for the advanced European countries, what, what is the what is the next step, so to speak, and the political parties are not giving it to us. So society goes into a surge mode, and you see different expressions of that. And which of these initiatives will bring up new ideas, I think the verdict is out. I'm very doubtful when it comes to the Occupy movement that I saw in Germany. I'm quite uh, optimistic when I see what is happening with the Pirate Party. Also, I have, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not a member, and I disagree with their politics. But something is happening there. And I'm really excited when I look at how we have citizens' initiatives that manage to throw over things that you thought there was a consensus, and you discover, no, there wasn't. It was just oversight <laughs> on behalf of the people affected by it. So. Very much. Mary. To close I, I agree with Helmut that there's a huge diversity, but I think what does come across is that we think of this as an economic crisis or a resource crisis, but fundamentally it's a political crisis. And that's what, fundamentally it's a political crisis, and I think that's what all these groups have in common, is this huge political frustration. I mean. If you look at figures on trust in politics, it's extraordinary. And trust in politics, in the UK, 86%, this is the latest Eurobarometer statistics, don't trust political parties. <laughs> but actually, you laugh, mm. but it's 78% in Germany. Mm. So the difference isn't as great as you might imagine. It's just an extraordinary level of distrust. 
So I think that while there's a huge, you know, all of these things seem to be happening at a same, similar time, and I very much agree with Laurie's point that it's not that it's purely Western, it's just how it's reported. And, you know, I think China and Russia, and it's extraordinary what's happening at the moment, this, this worldwide, if you like, political frustration. <laughs> So then, the, there are two really points I thought I wanted to mention. I mean, one is this debate we're having about what's the difference between the far right, what's the difference between emancipatory politics, and there may not be such a sharp divide, but what I think, from my observations, is very different is actually how they act. I mean, I agree about fear and hope, but I also think that the new emancipatory forms really try to practice democracy in their own practices, which the xenophobic groups don't do. They're very vertically organized and hierarchical, and Helmut in his paper talks about swarm intelligence to describe the ways in which people in Occupy and other protests organize. And the, emphasis on sort of horizontality, replaceability, you can come in and out, all of those things, you, everybody has a contribution to make, leaderlessness. These are all the characteristics of the emancipatory forms, and that's the really big difference, I think, with the sort of populist movements that Catherine's been studying. Um, I know Laurie wants to come in again, and oh, then I we, have... Are we, are we summing up? We're just arguing about the EDL. No, we're summing up. So I just <laughs> wanted to make, you know, in the end, I mean, there are millions of points. We could keep this conversation going for ages. But I just wanted to make, somebody said, well, how on earth do we, in the end, bring about change? And I do think, I mean, this may sound a bit sentimental, but I think... Everybody who's participated in these things feel it's a subjective experience which has changed them. That's one of the things I find very interesting and striking. And I think by changing themselves, they are actually changing society. Uh, if I think about the post-68 movements, we often think, well, they didn't go anywhere. But actually, somebody who lived through that whole period, society is now far more tolerant on racism, on sexual minorities, on all sorts of things. And, and, and that, I think, was, it was really a cultural effect. Of course, the post-68 movements kind of neglected social justice because that was the old movement. And so neoliberalism also had its day. Um, and now, so I think the question is, is, are these new movements, how are they going to affect thinking in a very fundamental way? And I suppose my concern is that in these kind of big moments of crisis when you <coughs> change is happening, it can go very badly wrong. And we're seeing it going very badly wrong in Syria at this moment. And the backlash from the conservative forces who can't in the long run win, but they can create terrible trouble and terrible violence. I mean, what worries me is the last time we went through such a crisis, we had two world wars with millions dying. And I think, I'm not saying we'll have a world war, but I think we could go through a very long period of violence which will make this change much, much more difficult. So we shouldn't be necessarily optimistic, but I suppose what I'm trying to say is it's not about winning power as much as it is about changing dominant ways of thinking. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Um, I'd like you, before joining me in thanking our panel, I'd like to say that um, the Civil Society Yearbook is on sale outside. Uh, it's also available to buy online. I am plugging it, as it were. Um, but I really would like you uh, to, to join me in thanking Mary Caldor, Helmut Anheyer, Ahmed Nagib <laughs> and Laurie Benny uh, for their contributions here tonight. And most of all, thank you for coming. Thanks.